This is Aranaca, at the base of the sacred Santa Catalina Mountains in Tucson, Arizona. It is the home of an extraordinary man. He's a composer, a poet, a teacher, a designer, a musician, a philosopher. He is the remarkable Mr. Mills, and this is only part of his story. The Starscape Singers, a ten-voice ensemble founded by Kenneth G. Mills. He is their conductor, co-composer, their artistic director, producer, and sponsor. It began in 1976 when Mr. Mills was teaching piano in Toronto, Canada. Three singers were having trouble during a rehearsal. They couldn't find the right sound and make it work in harmony with the others. They asked Mr. Mills to help. Now, as a young man, he had lost his voice for three years and had been told by doctors he would never be able to sing again. But I was told I wouldn't sing in 1940. And in 1976, 36 years later, uh, I was asked to help these singers. And boy, I said, I myself can do nothing. There's a father that doeth the work. And that force had better have a voice, because I haven't got it. And he said, can you help me? Can you help us? And I said, I don't know. Only the Father can do it. So I opened my mouth, and the most gorgeous sound came out. And I loved it. And I said, imitate it. It's yours. And he imitated it, and he had it. And every tone I gave, I received. And I... Explain that. Every tone I gave, I received more until I was able to set all the women, all the men, even those who had never sung. The Starscape singers have performed and distinguished themselves in Europe, the Baltics, Russia, and eight performances at Carnegie Hall. Their repertoire, extensive. Their presence, charismatic. And the sound is so unusual. Yes, it is, because it is given, as you notice, it's very steady. There's not, there's not a wobble in it. And uh, the sound it, being so steady requires such tension inherent within attitude. Because if the tension isn't there, if the attitude isn't there, there's so much person present that if it, of course, is always shaky. And so the singers have this straight sound, and only when I tell them do, I, do they wobble. And, and, or tremolo, you give me the tremulant. Well, you, you tell them with your fingers. I tell them with my fingers. The finger, this one's for, for one of the sopranos, it's for another soprano, and I have five women and five men. And I sing them all with my fingers, and they know exactly, and I want these two to come out more than this one. This one's down, if I want that out, I'd tell. So they, they can read my hand signs very, very quickly now. During a walk in the citrus garden, we were discussing nature and our relationship to it. Could you give me a poem on nature? Oh, <laughs> can I give you a poem on nature? Just a short one. Mm -hmm. Let me see, I placed my order. We walked in the garden and heard some talk. It wasn't from men. It was the wind in its frock. The water, it rippled a rhythm to time. And the flowers, they bowed their heads 
that the sound was divine. So the invisible wind caught us in its train, and lo and behold, what is the refrain? I am always present, I am at hand. Fret not, nor weep. I am the might of the omniscient. This is the plan. A oh. wind and its gown. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> just so spontaneous. I just love that. If I had tried to think it, it would never have happened. The transition for Mr. Mills to speak from a metaphysical platform began many years ago when a friend visited a psychic. In the reading, the psychic gave a message for Mr. Mills. It was that he must learn to speak the word again. Mr. Mills didn't pay much attention to it until some time later when the same message, the same phrase, you must learn to speak the word again, was surprisingly said to him while he attended the third of three public lectures given by a Buddhist monk on his way to Thailand. Each time he spoke, he seemed to search me out, and our eyes would meet, and if he got stuck with the right English word, it seemed that I could give it to him mentally, and he would say it, because English was not his first language. So, at the end of the third lecture, I was leaving and sneaking out the side so that I wouldn't cause any disturbance. I went in a voice no one had heard. He said, no, the girl I was with said, aren't you going to thank him? And I said, no, um, I thanked him with my eyes. So we were sneaking out and then in a voice that no one had heard, he said, words are important. You must learn to speak the word again. And I almost wilted. So I went up to the platform and I said, I thought I had spoken to you with my eyes. And he said, ah, yes, but words are important. You must learn to speak the word again. And the new movie. I mean, were you shocked? Were you surprised? I was were surprised you, with the statement. Frightened? Not frightened, but I wondered what it meant because the word again was there. And I didn't know whether I had gained the ability and it was to be my gain this lifetime or it was to do a repeat performance on a different level or a different, in a different octave. And so many considerations came because I did not speak easily uh, before people at one time at all. And uh, it was fascinating to consider having to speak in such a way that if the word was to be spoken again, it would have to be transformatory in its might. And I thought, well, I and myself can do nothing. So. I had to adopt the attitude that um, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in the sight of the one altogether lovely. And uh, I made a vow that I would speak of asked and, other and otherwise I would remain like everyone else. And So I have done that. The art world is also spending time studying his brushstrokes and style. He was 70 years of age when he first picked up a paintbrush. He never had a lesson. He never studied art. Sometimes he paints three or four canvases a week. I just love it because I'm totally fascinated by the natural e, um, ebullience that accompanies the painting. Who's painting? That is a question that rightfully could be asked. I, I, I appear to be, but uh, how it so happens so quickly and so suddenly 
it does often come to my consideration as Ken Mills. How are you doing this? You know nothing about painting. And yet it is done. So it is perhaps um, the motivation, whatever it is, uh, I don't get in the way of it and it happens. Well, you start with a black background. Why? It's the idea that the black is the unmanifested. And out of this can come all the colors that have been, been absorbed or non-reflected by it, you see. And so all these other colors start to stand out from the canvas so brilliantly that they're like jewels. At one point during our conversations, I asked Mr. Mills if there were anything he'd like to talk about. There seemed to be a long moment of reflection, as if he were moving into a different space. It is essential for the future that men and women don a new state of thought and question the thoughts that have bound them to a false condition of life and a false condition of identity. But what I say to the people, wake up and see. Don't bother recording your nightmare, but see if any part of what you are dreaming bears a stamp of reality. And be assured, if you perceive the passing, that there is hope for you. Because right in the perception of the passing stands that which is a constant. And in that, rejoice and be glad.